Papa Ron, we want you to come. Love this man of God, a friend of our house and uh, a friend of mine. And uh, I love people that I can be with. And we have honest conversations, but we love deeply. And uh, thank you for his uh, covenant relationship. And so let's welcome him this morning. Amen. Everybody say, I love you, Pastor Poole. Now look at, I want everybody to look right, stand up, Marvin. Y'all, everybody look at Marvin. Turn around and look at him. Just turn around and look at him. All right, everybody look at him. I want you to stretch your hand out this way and say this with me. I receive your apostolic mantle over my life. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. How many of y'all glad to know God's in a good mood today? I woke up this morning, he said, I'm happy you're awake. I said, I am too. <laughs> I started talking to the Lord about 3.30 this morning. And I, I told the Lord, I said, it'd really be okay if you let me sleep till about 7. I'd feel a lot better. But, you know, I'm okay getting up at 3.30, aren't you? And so, no, you're not. Not a one of you in this room. <laughs> it, it, but the thing about it is, is you got to know the, the wonderful and the magnificent love of the Father that's over you. I want to, you can turn your Bibles anywhere. I'll be somewhere in a minute, okay? I think I'm going to be in Luke chapter 5, so you can turn over there along about the end of the chapter. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about uncorking the bottle this morning a little while. We're going to get new wine and fresh wine skins, amen? And uh, I really think the heart of the Lord is is there. But I want, I want to talk about two or three things very quickly before I start my message today. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to be long, but I do want us to move toward an end result during our ministry time. But two things I want to say. Number one, this Awaken the Dawn that's coming up, I want to really encourage you to, to be a part of that. Right now there is a war going on in our country for righteousness and truth. And it doesn't matter who you voted for or who you didn't vote for. The United States of America is hanging in the balance. And it's going to take the prayers of the saints, of believers across this nation, in order to take us in a direction we need to go. The scripture says a king's hearts are like channels of water in the hands of the Lord. And he turns him whichever way he wishes. And the truth is, is that right now with this Judge Kavanaugh confirmation situation, I don't know if you've been following that or not, and please understand what, what's happening there is not political. What's happening there is that there is literally a hanging in the balance for where we're going. The Supreme Court justices are very significant in our country. And they, what, what, what's got to happen with this justice is we need the righteousness of the Lord to rain down in the middle of that situation, right? And a, lot of, a lot of people want to make it political. It's not political at all. It's about right and wrong. It's about life and death. It's about decisions made that's going to affect us for, for years to come. And so I want you to really, really begin to pour out your heart before the Lord in this area for our nation. Because I think we need to be praying for America like we've never prayed before. And uh, there, I, I believe that the Lord wants to ra raise up a righteous remnant in the country. Do you believe that? And so I think that if we're, if we're going to see that happen, we're going to have to pray. The other thing I want to I say, I want to make a shift. I want to talk about the house here. and I want to talk about what the Lord's doing. And I want you guys to know, I, when I come here, I feel like I'm home. And I've had a number of Bethel encounters here, if I can say that, you know, where I just got totally smashed and God did a work. So this is a special thing in my heart. But I, this morning, while I was praying very early this morning, the Lord reminded me that uh, I need to say to you that you guys are an apostolic house. You're an apostolic ministry. Does that make sense? Now, in order to understand that, a lot of people say, well, we don't understand that terminology. Well, you'll, you'll get to know it. Just kind of hang in. Don't get frustrated. But here's the thing about it. This church will not be known as my four and no more. You're going to be known as a church that reaches out and makes a difference everywhere you go. Amen? And guys, I'm going to just be honest with you. What God is doing at the harbor is not about him in Louisiana. It's about what he's doing in the earth. Does that make sense? Now, you're going to reach Hammond, but you're going to have to go way past that. And uh, whenever the um, pastor was talking about this Mandeville um, uh, interest meeting this evening, you need to pray into that. You need to start praying in. God's going to take you, and he's going to disperse you abroad, and he's going to cause the influence of what he's doing here to go into other areas. But it's not going to be contained just to this city, even to this region. You've got to understand God is giving you an international outreach. Does that make sense? 
Okay, there's three people that believe that, okay? How many of you know God's giving you an international outreach? How many of y'all know God's going to give you an international influence? How many of y'all believe that? How many of y'all have passports? Good, the rest of y'all need to get one. Because God's going to send you places. You know what? Here's the beauty of it all. Aren't you glad that the Lord has chosen you to go some places that he hasn't chosen anybody else? And you got to realize that in stepping into an international call into what God's doing, the Lord's doing something so significant here. And I really believe it's the heart of the Lord that what happens in this, this area here in this city in Hammond, Louisiana, and um, is, is, is powerful. But, guys, you got to carry what God's given you into the places that he gives you to go. So the Lord's opening up a lot of doors now. I think I see new... Um, doors and opportunities to be able to go into some places that God's going to begin to open the doors for you as well as for this congregation. And some of you are going to be going into places that you never thought you were going to go before. And I'm just telling you right now, you need to prepare yourself right now. You need to start getting things ready. Some of you need to really, I'm serious about getting passports. Some of y'all need to go get a passport. You need to keep your passport renewed because you never know when the Lord's going to drop something on you. To, it, in a, I mean, in a moment, you may be going to Canada or Mexico or Europe or Asia. You never know where the Lord's going to open those doors. Maybe South America. And I, I, I'm going to just, can I just go and prophesy something right quick? Can I just go and release this word to you? God's going to give you guys favor in South America. He's going to open up doors of opportunities into South America, and you're going to go in places in South America. You're going to have influence. You're going to be able to do ministry in South America. God's going to cause there to be an opportunity, and I see a fire starting in South America because of what God plants out of this house in that area. Amen. Can y'all receive that? Some of y'all are thinking, South America, yeah. Why not? Turn to your neighbor and say, why not? So I want you to understand, when Jesus said, you're going to be disciples, he, he didn't say you're just going to be a disciple here in the locale that you're in, the local area. It's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. It's time now for us to start thinking uttermost parts of the earth. Amen? So I want us to understand that as believers in Lord Jesus Christ, we've got to step into a, a really an opportunity God has given us to go forward. And this, I'm not giving you a commercial. I'm just telling you where you're going to go. That's what prophets do. We talk about where you're headed. And I'm telling you, destiny is about... The Lord opening doors and opportunities for you that you've never walked in before. And here's the thing about it. God didn't call you to be a settler. He called you to be a pioneer. Pioneers move forward into those areas. So I really see a lot of, uh, of sending and receiving going on. I, I see the fact that, that you know, you're going to be here, but you're going to go there for a few days or a week or two or maybe a month or so, and you're going to be coming back here. And I'm seeing the Lord as he's going to begin to disperse some things. It's almost like the Lord is sending rivers and tributaries out into places, out of this house and out of this region. He's going to be sending many of you to carry what God has deposited in your heart. And the thing about it is, right now, you don't think you have anything to give, but I'm just telling you, you've got a lot more to give than you imagine. You have a lot more inside you than you realize. And I'm telling you, you never know what's inside of you until God taps it. And when the Lord taps it and it starts flowing out, you're like, man, I didn't know that was in me. But I'm telling you, you guys are in a great place. Amen? Amen? You're in a great place for God to do some things. Well, Jesus was in Luke chapter 5 was speaking, and uh, he had gone out, and, and I'm going to just kind of set a basis for you, and then we're going to look at this verse of Scripture toward the end of, of chapter 5. But he was actually going out, and he was uh, he had been speaking to the multitudes, and then he turned and, and he called a guy out uh, named Levi who was a tax gatherer, and he said, I want you to come follow me. And he went into his house, and he was surrounded by tax gatherers and sinners, and the Pharisees looked at him and says, Why in the world are you hanging out with those kind of people? Why, are you, why, you know, don't you understand that we're over here and you ought to be with us, but you're out there with tax gifts and sinners? And he said, yeah, it's not those that are well that need a physician, it's those that are sick. So Jesus looked at him and he said, here's what I'm up to. I'm up to reaching out to people who haven't been reached yet. And they said, well, you don't understand that the disciples of John, they fast and pray, and we the Pharisees, we fast and pray, but your disciples aren't fasting and praying, and we don't understand why you're doing what you're going to do. And Jesus basically looked at them, and this is Ron okay basically this is what he said you guys hadn't got it yet you need to understand I didn't come for those that are on the right path I came to, to straighten the path out for people to walk on right 
And I'm going to tell you what he did was he challenged the religious system. And it was amazing because when Jesus called people to himself, he called them in a sinner state and then transformed who they were. Okay, three people just got that. He, he called them in a sinner state. So many times we don't realize that when you lay eyes on a person and you see them in their sin and you see them in their wrong, you cannot discount who they are and what God is doing in their life. He reached out and got them like that, and Jesus pulled them in. And it was interesting because sinners ran to Jesus, but the religious ran from him. Okay, The sinners ran to him, but the religious ran from him. And it's very important to understand that whenever Jesus looked at people, he saw the potential of the kingdom of God in their life. He didn't see them as, well, you're worthless and you're not going to make it and I don't know if you're going to ever change. No, he didn't look at it like that. He looked at them and he saw in them a destiny, a purpose, and a potential in their life and he called them into who they could be. Hear me? He called them into where they, who they could be. He called them into where they were going to go. And when you look at individuals, you don't need to be able to look at them and say, well, they're a drunk or they're a drug addict or they're this or that. You need to look at them and say, that person is a bundle of incredible potential waiting to be released in Jesus Christ. There is a destiny. There's a call. There's something in their life that is uniquely different, and God's doing a good work in them. Amen? And you need to understand God's doing a good work in you. Turn to your neighbor and say, God's working on you. Philippians 1, 6 says this, For I am calling to this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue until, until the day of Christ Jesus. And so the Lord, the Lord is working in you. He, you see, your work in progress, your, your life is under construction. You've got to understand, God's doing something inside you, and where you are now is not where you're going to be a year from now or five years from now or ten years from now. But I just want to say something prophetically. I feel this so strong in my spirit this morning that God is going to add to the years of your life. Many of you are going to get your lives extended, and you're going to live longer than you could ever imagine because God's up to something in your life. How many of you want an extension to your life? You see, it's about God doing something that is so unique, and he's working inside you. He's doing a work, and he's transforming you. And when he looked at Levi, even though he was a sinner and a tax gatherer, he said, I want you to come follow me. Well, it tore up the religious people. And let me tell you something now you've got to understand. The Lord will offend your mind to reveal your heart. Okay? Number two, he will challenge your religious System, your religious mindset, your religious way of life, he will challenge that in order to pull you into a relationship with him that is life-giving. Amen? And I'm going to be real honest with you. There's a lot of Christian people out there today, they're afraid to be seen eating with sinners and with people who maybe aren't truly right with God. But I'm telling you right now, it is those kind of people Jesus went after. Amen? That's who he hung out with. Why did he do that? Because he wasn't afraid of them changing him. He wanted to change them. Does that make sense? And so he turns around and he looks at his disciples and he, and he starts his parable and he's telling them a story. He said, you know, nobody takes a piece of cloth from a new garment and put it on an old garment because you'll both tear the new and the patch off the new will not match the old. And he said, you need to understand, there, there's something that's going to change. And I, I'm sure these disciples were standing there looking at him, scratching their head, thinking, they just asked you about fasting and praying, and you're talking about cutting up garments. What are you talking about? How many of y'all know Jesus sometimes spoke in parables, and he spoke in stories, and they, they stood there and looked at him like, well, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> they didn't fully understand. But Jesus was trying to say something that was very unique. He said, you need to understand. I'm coming to give you a new garment, and you can't take a patch off what I'm giving you and put it on the old and expect it to fix it because you're going to tear the new that I'm giving you, and you're going to try to put the new on the old, and the new will not match the old. Guys, listen to me. The Lord is doing something so strategic during this day that he's giving us a new garment, if I could use that term. He's giving us new garments, and the Lord is doing something so powerful with us that he's taking us out of a religious system and he's beginning to move us into a relationship with him where we understand the power of change. Guys, listen to me. The way we do church is changing. It just is. 
And, and literally, it's, it's something that, that we've got to grab hold of. I mean, the Lord is taking the church back to a presence-driven atmosphere. And so Jesus went, went on and he told another story. And, and this is really what I want to talk about. And he said, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. So he said, you need to understand, we don't take new wine and put it in the old because he said the old wineskin will burst underneath the change of the new wine. Now, the interesting thing about wine is this, is if you ever study wine, or you, and I'm not a wine connoisseur, but I went back looking at what this scripture meant and what really what Jesus was talking about. And in my study, I found out that whenever grapes are crushed and the juice comes out and they put it in a container, as long as that juice is left alone, it will go through a process of change. And back in the Old Testament, or in the New Testament days, what they would do is they didn't have glass containers. They would take wine skins, and, and when they would kill an animal, they'd clean the skin really well, and then they would sew it up, and then they would put the wine in the skin, and the wine skin actually became the container for the new wine. But as the new wine, as a, as a juice would begin to change and it would begin to ferment, it literally would begin to change the composition of the wine skin. And the wine skin began to conform to the contents that it held. And so whenever they would empty that, it was basically useless as far as a wine container any longer, and they had even tried to put new wine in it, but under the change of the new wine, that skin would burst. And Jesus said, when you put the new in the old, you're going to tear the old, and you're going to lose the new. Now, guys, listen to me. Everybody say, I'm listening. What God is doing inside of us today is so new and so real that many times it's going to challenge what we've always thought. And I don't know about you, but I, I was raised up in church, and, you know, I, I, I was my mom and dad uh, put us in a particular denominational church, and our, the church I raised was raised up it was very legalistic. But the thing about it is, is that, you know, as I began to grow up, there were certain things that we did and we didn't do. And I, after I got older and went to college and began studying Scripture deeper, I began to find out that a lot of the systems that I was taught were not the systems of the Word of God. It was the system of the domination that I was in. And so my life became conformed to that. And then all of a sudden, as I began studying the Scripture, I began realizing that there's far more than I could ever imagine. For instance, the, the denomination I grew up in really didn't teach us about the Holy Spirit. They didn't really talk to us. It's kind of like you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit, and that's it. Well, I had an encounter in 1982 with the Holy Spirit, and whenever I did, it changed everything about my life. And all of a sudden, because of the freshness and the newness of the Spirit of the Lord in my life, things began to change. And so I began to study about the New Testament, or study about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts in the New Testament. And I began realizing that the Holy Spirit was doing something so different than anything that I had ever been taught. And it wasn't the fact that, that I was looking down or criticizing the, the, the way I grew up in church. It wasn't that at all. It's just I began to realize that I wasn't living and walking in everything that the Lord had. And now God was putting some new wine in my life. And by the Holy Spirit, that new wine was causing there to be a change in my life. And so when I found this scripture, I realized, you know what? Jesus even spoke to that in the end. And he was looking at them saying, guys, listen, you've had a system of doing things that you call church or religion, but I'm coming now to bring my Father's kingdom, and I'm going to bring you something new that you have never encountered before. And whenever I pour out this new wine, when I begin to teach you about the kingdom, when I, when I begin to bring you the fullness of the Holy Spirit, it's going to begin to challenge and change things about your life that you've never seen before. I didn't grow up in a church where healings and miracles were happening every week. I was taught, well, if it's the Lord's will, maybe you'll be healed. Nobody ever told me that I would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. And so all of a sudden, I had to take on a new belief system. I mean, there were things about the Holy Spirit that, that I began to take on whenever I was uh, 22 years old, whenever I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. There were things that began to change my life. And all of a sudden, my whole ministry began to change. Everything I did, the way I preached, the way I taught, the way I lived, 
the way I ministered to be, it all began to change. And all of a sudden, I began to recognize there were things that God was doing in me. But I had to undergo a change. And really what happened was I couldn't take what I was gaining from the Holy Spirit and putting in, put it in the old container, the old wineskin of the way I'd been raised. In fact, I got the left foot of fellowship out of the church that I was in. You know what that is? Boom. <laughs> I, I got to the place. I started talking too much about the Holy Spirit and doing stuff that he did, and the church I was in didn't like it. You know, they said, we don't do that around here. I said, well, how come it's in the Bible if we don't do this? And I got myself in a whole lot of trouble. You know what I'm talking about? And I remember whenever, whenever they invited me to go find another place to go to church, <laughs> I realized I got to find something that's different. What was happening? My wineskin, my wineskin that I grew up with, the wineskin that, that I had believed in, everything I knew about church wasn't where I was. And all of a sudden, my theology began to change. Everything about my relationship with the Lord began to change. But this thing about Holy Spirit, began to change who I was. When Jesus talked about the new wine, he talked about the Holy Spirit. The new wine is Holy Spirit. It's his life. It's his move inside of us. And guys, listen, we got to learn how to let our lives be conformed to what Holy Spirit is doing inside of us, right? I remember, well, I remember the first time I ever spoke in tongues. I didn't even believe in it. I was taught it was of the devil. And I, I had this war going on in my mind. This sure feels right, but I guess I need to repent because the devil got a hold of me. You know what I mean? Because in the denomination I grew up in, that's what they taught. Well, that all passed away. And all of a sudden, I began to live out. As I began to change to this new wine, this Holy Spirit that was coming in my life in 1982, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and filled, all of a sudden, I began to do things. I began to pray for people, and stuff that I was told would never happen began to happen. Well, I had to get a new wineskin. I couldn't let the new wine that was being poured into my life be lost. Now, here's the interesting thing. Jesus said, when you put the new wine in the old wineskin, not only will the old wineskin break, but you're going to lose the new wine you poured in. And guys, listen to me. I've seen more people shipwreck in their relationship with God because they're trying to take on the new of God, and they're not changing to what God is doing in the now. Amen? And you've got to learn how to change. You've got to learn how to embrace what God's doing. You know, I was taught, it was kind of interesting on this deal of healing. I was taught, well, when you pray for somebody, you pray if the Lord wills that he'll heal them. That way, if he doesn't heal them, it's the Lord's will. If he does heal them, it's the Lord's will. And you got a way out. Well, I found out the Lord's not interested in giving me a way out. He's interested in me walking by faith. Amen? And so I had to come to the place that I had to change my wineskin. And I was taught by pastors and leaders in the church, and I was a young minister, and I was taught, you don't ever do that. You're going to crush people's faith. How am I going to crush somebody's faith by, by getting them to believe that Jesus will heal their life? That's not crushing their faith. It's raising their faith to a new level. And I found out that all of a sudden the religious system that I was in was much like the Pharisees. They were trying to pull Jesus down and Jesus was trying to raise them up. And we're in a tug of war right now where the enemy is trying to delude us and deceive us through religious systems and the Lord is trying to pull us out of religious systems into relationships and he's trying to pull us into that place where the power of his presence will radically change our life. Listen, there is no limit to what God can do. Amen? And I'm telling you where we are prophetically right now. You need to grab this. We are in a, an Ephesians 3.20 time where he is doing exceeding abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think. And we've got to be willing to grab hold of that and say, God, I allow you to do in me what you want to do. Guys, it's time to get a wineskin that says, Lord, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever it is that you want to do in my life, I'll embrace it. Lord, I will not limit you. I will not cap you. Lord, I will not stop you. But, Lord, you take me as far as you can go. I, I got a word for someone here just recently, and I looked at them, and it really blew their mind. I said, God gives you the, the right. He gives you the opportunity to exaggerate anything that he can do, and he will surpass that and do more than you could ever say. 
And they looked at me and they said, do what? I said, God gives you the opportunity. He gives you the right to exaggerate anything that he can do, and he will surpass it and do greater and more than anything that you can do. They said, I can't even begin to understand that. Well, I understand that we can't understand that because we have lived in a limited theology, in a limited belief system. We have limited ourselves to religious systems, and we don't understand that God is an exceeding abundant God that does more than we could ever imagine. Amen? Guys, it's time now to pull the cap off. It's time to uncork the bottle. It's time to let the new wine flow. We have moved into the new Hebraic year, 5779, and this is a year where the new wine flows freely. And I'm telling you right now, the wine of the Spirit is wanting to flow in the lives of people. And we've got to have a wine skin. We've got to have a wine skin to take on what God's doing. But Jesus says something in this last verse which was very interesting. And this is really a warning. And he says this in verse 39, And no one after drinking the old wine wishes for the new, for he says the old is good enough. That's a warning. You need to be very careful that you don't allow the old and what you've experienced to keep you from experiencing the new and changing to what God is doing. God is not obligated to do what he has done like he did it before. God is a creative God. He is ever moving. He's ever changing. And God can do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it, the way he wants to do it, and it's really okay. Amen? You got to make room for the Lord. You can't just say, hey, the old wine's good enough. No, you got to understand the old wine gives you an appetite for the new wine, not to stay where the old wine was. Let me say that again. The old wine gives you an appetite for the new wine, and the new wine will literally begin to carry you in a new way. You got to understand. God is interested in giving you something new. You know what's so exciting about walking with the Lord? He's always doing something that's ready to blow your mind. God's trying to get you out of a box. Listen, the Lord colors way outside the lines, and he operates way outside the box. And God's a God that's wanting to take you on a journey and release you into an area of creativity like you've never seen. In fact, let me just say this to you. The Lord is releasing a creative spirit over his sons and daughters right now. And if you choose to receive it, I'm telling you, God will do more through you than you could imagine. But you got to take a risk. You see, you can't say, well, the old is good enough. I remember when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1982, I went in my dorm room, and I said, Lord, when I read my Bible, the churches I'm going into are not like that. I want to be like that. I don't want to be like them. I want to be like that. And I, whenever I had that encounter with the Holy Spirit, it began to change everything about my life. I didn't realize I was asking for trouble. In fact, the guy later on, he said, you know what the real, ab- real uh, evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is? I said, no. He said, it's trouble. <laughs> I started laughing. I thought, well, I guess that's right because it got me in a lot of trouble. But, you know, here's the interesting thing. The baptism in the fullness of the Spirit got me into a new way of doing things. And when I took on that new wineskin, I was saying to the Lord, Lord, thank you for the old wine, but I'm not, I'm not going to live by the old wine. I want the new wine. You're doing something so radical and something new. Now, here's what we got to understand. When God starts doing the stuff with us, we're going to start seeing what we have read about all of our lives. L- let me just throw out a couple of radical things. How many of you personally have ever seen a person raised from the dead? How many of y'all want to see a person raised from the dead? Now, are you going to have to get a new wine skin in order to see somebody raised from the dead? Yeah, you are. The old wine skin says, well, that doesn't happen anymore. My mother, whenever, just before she died, in fact, I talked to my mom the morning before she died, and uh, I didn't know she was going to die, but I was talking to her, and she was trying to prepare me because she knew that she was fixing to go and be with Jesus. And so she and she and I got in this conversation. I said, Mom, you're not going to go. She said, well, just promise me one thing. I said, what is it? She said, you promise me when I die, you're not going to practice resurrection on me. <laughs> I said, why are you making me promise you that? She said, because I know you. I know how you believe it. I know what you want, and I'm just telling you right now, whenever I get out of this body, do not drag me back in it. I'm going to be with Jesus. Go find somebody else to work on. She really did. 
Now, you got to understand my mother. In fact, she looked at me. She said, if you raised me from the dead, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to raise up and slap the dog out of you. <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. And you know what? Should have done it. I promise you should have done it. She wouldn't even thought twice about doing it. But my mom went on to say, my son, I know one day you're going to do that for people. And you know what? We've seen two people raised from dead in our ministry already. Can I just tell you it gives you a new wineskin? Let me tell you something. When somebody who's dead raises up into life right there before your very eyes, it'll freak you out. Somebody asked me one time, so what's it like? I said, I was freaked smooth out. And I realized all of a sudden, how how many of y'all know when we pray for God to do things, we really don't expect him to do it? I mean, really, seriously. I I mean, you pray for things. How many of y'all, when you pray for something and God does it, you're surprised? Wow, look at that. Oh, check this out. You know, you know what that's telling us? Our faith is not in that he can do it. Most of us, most of us are so surprised when we ask God to do something. He doesn't. Guys, listen, God's got to get us to the place that we expect him to do what we ask him to do. We need to get into the place. I'm, I'm, not, taking, we, I'm not talking that we need to be um, nonchalant or apathetic about it. I'm talking about we need to walk in a confidence, and we need to pray with a confidence that whatever we ask in his name, he'll do it. We need to walk with that confidence. And look, look, Jesus sent the disciples out. And uh, <laughs> they, they went out and did the stuff, and they came back. And they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. He said, yeah, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I've given you authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject. You rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So they were surprised, and Jesus said, don't be surprised. I've given you authority to do that. Don't be surprised that whenever you speak to a demonic power that it leaves the body. I prayed for a guy this, is best, this past Thursday night, three days ago. A kid came to me. This kid's 19, 20 years old, just graduated from high school, entering college. He looked at me, and this is what he said. He said, I've got a spirit to hold of me I need to get free from. I said, okay, come here. I just laid hands on him. I prayed for him. When I prayed for him, that thing left his, his body just like that. When I got done, I said, how you doing? He said, it left. I felt it leave my body. I didn't make a big deal out of it. There were about 20 people in the room when I prayed for this kid. He didn't scream, holler. He didn't fall on the floor. He didn't convulse. He didn't do any of that. He just went, mm, and that was it. Mm. But he's free. I got a text from him yesterday. He said, I just want you to know I'm absolutely free of that thing that plagued my life. Back when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I was casting devils out of people at college, and they almost kicked me out of school because we didn't believe in it. (laughs) I had to get a new wineskin. You see, the new wineskin was able to conform. Today, Casting a demon out of a person is not a big deal. Raising a person from the dead is not a big deal. Healing. We, we, I prayed for, I, I think we've had eight or ten healings this last week that we saw in our ministry in places I've gone. I, I got a, a text Tuesday from a place I was at this last weekend, and, I mean, the healings and the miracles were just numerous that we had saw. You know, I got a new wineskin. Now, I'm at a place, I used to live like, God, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? And I still live in that. But I'm at a place now to where I expect God to do the very things that I ask him to do. Amen? If I pray for somebody with cancer, I expect them to get healed. I'm not surprised when they get healed. I'm surprised when they don't get healed. Does that make sense? And so we take on a new wineskin. Now, let me move very quickly. How do we know? How do we know the fruit of this new wine working in our new wineskin? When I take on a new wineskin and I say, okay, I'm not going to just let the old be in anymore. I'm looking for the new. I'm not going to say that life is good enough. In fact, guys, I'm going to be real honest with you. I just celebrated my 43rd year of ministry. I'm 58 years old. And for 43 years, I've been doing ministry. And I'm at a place in my walk with God. I'm saying, Lord, thank you for everything you've ever done. But, God, I want to see more than you could ever do. Amen? I, 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 am, I am living. I, I'm afraid I'm going to die before I get everything out. That's the truth. I'm afraid. It's kind of like, Lord, please don't take me. Somebody asked me today, said, are you ready for the rapture? I said, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not ready to go yet. 
I told the Lord the other day, I said, if you would just hold up a little while, we got a lot more work to do. Amen? Because I realize something's happening. But, but, but I know that there's, there's, there's a freshness of the new wine that's coming in my life. But you know, Paul, whenever he talked to the Galatian church, he said, here's how you're going to know that your wine skin is taking on the DNA of the new wine. In Galatians 5.22, it says it, 22 and 23 actually, it says this, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against those things there is no law. How do you know that your wineskin is taking on the new wine? How do you know that the wine of the Spirit, the wine of the new life of Jesus, how do you know that that wine is affecting you, and how do you know it's pouring out of you? This is how you know. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control begins to flow out of your life. You see, a lot of us, and, 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 and you know, I went, I went from the denomination I was in to, to Pentecostalism, and, you know, I began to take on that dynamic of, well, you know, the real evidence of the baptism is speaking in tongues. And I got it. But I was always questioning, well, how come, how come if I'm baptized with the Holy Spirit and I speak in tongues, how come everybody around me is so mean? <laughs> Anybody ever been there before? Well, Lord, how come if I'm in this spirit filter, how come we're still so legalistic? And I went from one legalism to another legalism, and I'm not knocking, you know, the Baptist that I came from. And the Pen I'm not knocking any of that. I'm just simply saying, I began to read my Bible, and I thought, if I'm been baptized with the Holy Spirit, I need to be loving better and having more peace and having more peace. And all of a sudden, I began to realize that the wineskin that I'm taking on from the Lord, this new wineskin, it's going to be molded to the new wine. And the new wine isn't just speaking in tongues, which it is. I mean, that's cool. But I also have to realize that the fruit of that new wine in me is going to produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So people come to me now, and they say, well, I've lost my joy I said okay let's pray for you to for have a fresh feeling what do you mean I just need joy I said no you need a fresh feeling of Holy Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit is joy so if you lost your joy guess what you need you need some Holy Spirit in you amen is that right? Now, why do you need fillings of the Holy Spirit? Because the Bible says in Acts 13, 52, and the disciples were continually filled, say continually filled, with joy and Holy Spirit. Joy and Holy Spirit go together. Amen? If you lost your joy, you need some Holy Spirit in you. Why do you need that? Because you leak. Turn your neighbor and say you leak. Some of y'all leaked this week. <laughs> Did you know that? How many, all right, now I'm just going to prove it to you right quick because I'm wrapping this thing up and pray for you. How many of y'all manifested this week? Oh, I didn't do that. Okay, how many of y'all fleshed out this week? How many of y'all lost your patience this week? How many of you lost your peace this week? How many of you lost your joy this week? How many of you lost your self-control this week? <laughs> Come on now. How many of y'all manifested when somebody cut you off driving down the highway? How many of y'all got hacked whenever Burger King took too long? How many of y'all got messed up at Walmart because somebody did something you shouldn't have done, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How many of y'all leaked this week? Everybody better raise their hand right now. This is not a trick question. See, i got to ask myself, am I continually filled? You see, the mandate of the kingdom is the fresh wine of the Spirit is going to continually fill, but it also is going to continually flow. And guys, listen to me. The more that you get of the flow of the new wine of the Spirit of God, when that container, that wine skin that you have, when it begins to fill up, it's going to come out. But listen to me. Too many Christian people want to cork the bottle. Well, I got my feeling of the Holy Spirit. Let me cork it because I don't want to lose it. Guys, let me just tell you something. The Lord built you to give out the Holy Spirit everywhere you go, not cork it and keep it. Got it? He called you and I to pour out. Say pour out. Turn your neighbor and say you're supposed to pour out. 
God called you to be a wineskin that dispenses the new wine. He called you and I to leak. He called us to take what is inside of us and give it away. And I've got a good news for you. When you pour out the new wine of the Spirit out of your life, God's got plenty more wine to fill you up with. There is an unending flow of the Spirit of the living God. There is an unending flow of the new wine of the Spirit that He will give you. You don't have to be afraid of giving away what you've got because the more you give away, the more you get. And whenever it comes in, it is fresh and it's new and it's creative and it's powerful and it'll produce something inside you. I'm telling you, the more you give away, the more you encounter of God. <laughs> I started praying for coals before I prayed for cancer. After I prayed for cancer, I started raising the dead. I started pouring out. And when I began to pour out in the little, God began to open doors for the lot. A lot of people say, how do you get into all that big stuff? You start doing the little stuff first. Like loving your neighbor or your husband or your wife or your mom and daddy or your kids. You start having patience with your employer when he asks you to do something you don't want to do. That happened this week, didn't it? I have self-control. I don't have to give you a piece of my mind whenever you do something I don't like. Let me give you a, let me give you a news bulletin. Do not give away a piece of your mind. You need all you can, you got. You need to keep what you got. But you need to learn how to let the flow of the Holy Spirit. Can I just say it's a whole lot better to pour out love than anger? You know, you know what's so good about pouring out love and anger? Whenever you pour out love instead of pouring out anger, you don't have to go back and repent for it. You don't have to ask somebody to forgive you of hurting them or cutting them or destroying them. You know what? You pour love out. And you know what? We've got to learn how to pour out. It's time to take the cork out of your bottle and let the new wine of the Spirit flow out of your new wine skin. And you've got to get that wine skin to carry what God has put inside you. How many of y'all realize you have got something inside you that that world out there needs? People out there that are not in church today, that are not walking with God today, people out there that have no consciousness of God, people out there... <laughs> literally need the fresh wine of the Spirit. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine over in Lafayette this week. I'm going to go over and preach in a few weeks. And he said, I got to tell you about something just happened. He said, there was a lady came to our church, and she ran up. She said, Pastor, I got a new Bible. He, she, he looked at her. And he said, oh, really? What kind? She said, my first one. He said, what? He said, that's my first one, Pastor. I've never had a Bible before. This lady was in her 30s. And he stood there and he looked at her and he said, all of a sudden I began to think, my God, here's a 30-year-old woman who's never had a Bible living in Louisiana. I mean, how many of y'all know we're living in the Bible Belt of the United States where everybody has been saved at least once or twice? <laughs> they live like hell, but they're still saved, right? That's, that's, you know, when you live like hell and you call yourself a Christian and you say you need, you need some fresh wine in you, right? Amen? Because you'll start living like heaven. And he said, I looked at this woman and said, I cannot even imagine. But he said, you know, it made me realize that sometimes in church we get so insulated and we don't recognize there are people out there in the cities we live in that need the fresh touch of God in their life. We think everybody out there has got it together. Are you kidding me? You need to go to Walmart and just start going up and down the lines and loving on folks, tell them about Jesus. Because God's up to something. How many of y'all ready to pull the cork out? How many of y'all ready to uncork the bottle and let the wine flow? Let's all stand. Father, I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Lord, I pray the fresh wine and the new wine of your presence will carry us forward. And Lord, I pray, Lord, the fresh flow of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask you, Lord, give us the new wine.